What is going on guys? In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can set up a Aurora RDS serverless instance using either MySQL or Postgres. And then once we set up the instance, I'm gonna show you how you can interact with it using the data API through the AWS console. And that's gonna be through the query editor, which is a cool tool where you can kind of create tables, insert data into your tables within the confines of the AWS console. So just before we get into that, a quick little introduction to like what serverless is is and why it's a cool new technology that a lot of people are dabbling in. Um, so where this fits in or where serverless fits in is to address the gap where we have very unpredictable traffic patterns. Think about a application that um, has a very short period of high throughput on that database. Using the traditional database model where we have a provisioned uh, instance or a provisioned machine, this really doesn't work very well because you're paying for that machine throughout the duration of the day, even though you're not really using it to its full capacity, except for a couple moments during the day. It can also be useful for developers, like a lot of developers are only active during the workday. So maybe for your um, test or beta environments, you want to use an Aurora serverless instance to kind of shave off on some of the cost. So these are a couple reasons on why Aurora serverless is an attractive option to use as a database technology. Um, so let's actually get into actually building this thing and setting everything up. So here I am in the AWS console. So I'm just gonna go to the top here and type in RDS so that we can go ahead and create our serverless database. Taking a little moment here, there we go. Okay, so this is the default screen of RDS. So we're gonna go ahead and click on create database. And from here, we get an initial question as to whether or not we want to do the standard create or easy create. Make sure that for this exercise, you are leaving it as default on standard create, because if you use easy create, you're not going to be able to specify uh, serverless and you're not going to have access to a lot of the other options that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so let's keep it on standard for now and scroll down a little bit here to our next uh, set of options, which are engine options. So we are going to be using Amazon Aurora for this uh, demonstration. Now, Aurora is the only offering from RDS that supports serverless. Now, keep in mind that Aurora is compatible with both MySQL or Postgres. So uh, although it's showing like different options here for Postgres and MySQL, keep in mind that you're going to be able to use um, the MySQL or Postgres dialects to interact with your database as long as you specify the right types down here. So you can choose either or, it really doesn't matter for this demo, but whatever you're comfortable with or whatever your organization already uses is probably a good idea. Now scrolling down a little bit more um, to a couple more options. Now in terms of capacity type, provisioned is the standard model where uh, if you were to leave this on as provisioned, you would kind of create a database instance. And that's not what we want to do here. We don't want to create a physical machine. We want to use the serverless option and let AWS and the RDS team manage all of that stuff for us. Um, so as you can see, like after I clicked that, it reduced a lot of the options, which is great for us. Simplicity is a good thing. Um, and it's just asking us which version of MySQL that we want to use here. Now, by default, it's suggesting 5.6. There's also 5.7 available. I'm just going to leave this on 5.6 simply because that was the default setting. And I'm just going to close that. Not sure how that opened. Okay, so moving on to the settings section. Now, DB cluster identifiers. So pick a name that's representative of your project. Um, so I'm just going to call this serverless underscore demo. And in terms of credential settings, so this is something that you're going to want to specify um, for default for master username, it's going to give you admin. You can click on this box here to auto generate a password if you wish. I'm just going to put in a password here that I'm going to remember, and that is admin123, admin123. Okay, perfect. And we're going to be able to use that password later to manage our database. Uh, moving down to capacity settings. Now this is where things start to get interesting and we get to specify some of the settings for um, the serverless component of RDS. So there's, there's a concept here called minimum Aurora capacity unit. So the capacity units or ACU, sometimes you'll see them in shorthand form, are the main um, kind of performance or throughput levers that you have to, to pull to either increase or decrease the amount of throughput that Aurora is going to give you for your application. So one is the lowest here, as you can see, and this goes quite high. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to scroll there. 
Um, it goes up to 256 here, and that is 488 gigabytes of RAM. So make sure that, you know, if you're clicking the really highest settings here, you know what you're doing. If you have auto scaling on, that means that you're going to be able to potentially scale up to this machine, which can be, or not machine, but this amount of capacity units. And this can be pretty expensive. So I wouldn't set this too high if I were you. I would keep it something more manageable that, uh, you know, you're not going to really go above. And if you find out that that's not working later, you can always come back and adjust this stuff. Um, so I'm just going to leave this on eight for now. And I suggest for you as well to just keep it on the lowest when you start out. Now, I also want to expand this setting here, additional scaling configuration to talk about two of these options here. So the first one says for scaling the capacity to the specified values when the timeout is reached. So I had to actually look this up because I didn't really understand how this worked. And um, just to give you a quick summary here, the way auto scaling works in Aurora, at least V1, which is what's offered right now, is that um, when you kind of exceed a certain threshold, Aurora is going to try and find a moment in time where there's no traffic, where it can increase the capacity of your database. Now, it's going to time out after 45 seconds if it cannot find a period of time that is suitable to upscale to your database. Now, what ticking this setting actually does says that if 45 seconds elapse and it's not able to find a time um, or, or like a period of time where there's no traffic, I want to force the upgrade. I want to make sure it happens. Now, the default is just kind of try it again and, and try to find an open spot to increase the capacity. But by doing this, it's going to be forceful. And what that means is that if there's any um, running transactions or any running queries at that moment in time, when the 45 seconds is expired, those are going to be aborted. So decide if that's okay with you. Um, I'm going to leave it as off because um, I don't want to interrupt any running queries. And I, I think that's probably what most people are going to do here. And the second option here, pause compute capacity after consecutive minutes of inactivity. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. It allows you to set thresholds to downscale your ACUs, your Aurora capacity units, which by the way, are the primary uh, pricing units that you're built on. Um, what this allows you to do is kind of downscale after a period of, in of inactivity when you don't have any actively running queries, say for example, after, I don't know, five minutes or 10 minutes or so. Um, so you can specify this by default. It's five minutes, I believe. And you actually can't reduce this below five. That's actually the minimum. So just keep that in mind. You can only increase it from here. I'm just going to leave it as off uh, because that's what the default setting was. Now, in terms of connectivity, a lot of you that have used RDS before know that it operates within a context of a VPC. Um, I'm not going to really change this stuff. We're going to launch it into our uh, just default VPC that comes with our AWS account. But I do want to point out a difference between Aurora serverless and the classic RDS, which is that with classic RDS and you, where you have an actual running machine, you're able to expose that machine, that database instance to the public internet. So that if you're, for example, you're using MySQL Workbench on your home computer, you want to be able to access your RDS instance on the cloud. You can open that up to the public internet, maybe set up some network access control list to, to restrict it to your IP address. But regardless, you're still able to interact with it from somewhere else off of the cloud. So your home network as an example. Now with Aurora serverless, that's not possible. You can't get public access. But what you can do is use the data API. And we're going to get into that in a few moments here. So I just want to kind of tease that a little bit and let you know that that's coming up. But just keep in mind, you can't get public access if you're using Aurora serverless. Um, you are able to either use the data API, which we're going to talk about and use in this walkthrough, or you need a instance of a machine, uh, like an EC2 machine or whatever you're using to access your database. It needs to be in the same VPC that you're launching your instance in here. And you need to have all your security groups, network access control lists, and uh, route table route set up to facilitate those interactions. So just keep that in mind. I actually have another video where I walk you through how to do that with RDS uh, specifically. So check that one out. I'll try to put that in the description section below. Um, so moving on here, I was just rambling there. I apologize. Um, you want to make sure that you tick this guy. And this is an important setting. So data API. Let's just read this out really quick. Oops, didn't mean to check that. Enable the SQL HTTP endpoint, a connectionless web service API for running SQL queries against this database. When the SQL HTTP endpoint is enabled, you can also query your database from inside the RDS console. So I'm going to tick this because this is what we are going to be using in this exercise. And I just want to pause to really 
tell you like how awesome of a feature this thing is. So tr traditionally when you're using um, databases, you are forming a connection to those databases um, through your EC2 machine or through your home machine or whatever you're using and then interacting it directly um, using SQL queries. And um, there's a bunch of problems with this, especially if you're using something like Lambda, where you um, can have many, many containers that get spun up and they can all try to acquire their own connection to their, to their database. And there's an overhead for having too many connections. It can actually severely impact the performance of a database. So by using this data API, it totally eliminates that. It means that you don't need to interact with your database by using the database connection in contrast, you can use just an HTTP endpoint to make a service call the same way that you would make a service call to like a RESTful website, for example, or a RESTful endpoint. Um, you can use that methodology to interact with your database, and then you can provide it with your SQL inside that request. It's super, super handy, and behind the scenes, uh, the folks at uh, Aurora Serverless are managing that connection pool for you so that you don't even have to worry about it. How cool is that? And also by enabling this, it allows you to interact with um, with the database using the query console, which we're going to go through in a few moments just to demonstrate um, how to connect and how to interact with this database in general. So make sure to tick this guy because uh, it's going to be required for the rest of this. And uh, additional configuration, I don't think there's anything we need to do here. So initial database name, you can name this whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to call mine serverless underscore demo and leaving everything as default. You can see here that it's using encryption, which is good. Everything is set up. I'm actually going to disable deletion protection because I'm going to want to clean this thing up a little bit later. Uh, so from there, I'm going to go ahead and click on create database. Now, keep in mind, oops, serverless demo must contain. OK, so no underscores. It does not like underscores. So just serverless demo. And we're going to go ahead and try that again. Click on create database. And it looks like that did not encounter any initial errors. Um, so if we take a look here, now it's under creating. So you can keep an eye on this. Typically it takes a few minutes as you can see up here. So I'm just going to periodically refresh this and fast forward this until this thing is available. So stay tuned. All right, guys. So that took around five minutes or so. You can see now that my database is now in the available status, which is great. Uh, so from here, if you want to kind of just explore, you can click on this guy and check out a bunch of the different settings. Uh, so you can see here that our endpoint is this guy here and it's operating on this port. And just check out like some of the different uh, tabs here. So there's monitoring if you want to keep, keep an eye on your application. Uh, there's logs and events to let you know of any uh, kind of upgrades or any uh, reboots that need to occur. There's configuration if you want to change any of these settings such as uh, the admin passwords and all that stuff. Maintenance and backups and the list goes on. You can and, uh, take some time here. But what I want to show you is how we can actually interact with this database now. And the way that we can do that um, through, through the console itself is this new feature called Query Editor. So if you click on this guy, um, this is going to bring up some options here that allow us to connect to our database through our uh, browser here, as opposed to using a tool like uh, MySQL Workbench, for example. So uh, database instance or cluster, we're going to pick our cluster name and then um, add a new database credentials. And I believe I put in admin and then admin one, two, three. Uh, enter database or schema name. I think I use serverless underscore demo, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just try that, see if it works. Looks like it did, which is great. So as you can see here, this is the console where you can run your queries and then you'll see your output down here. Let me actually um, make this a little smaller so you can see everything at once here. So if you just click on run by default, it just runs this query that was provided. Not sure what this does, but it just kind of tells you some um, details about this uh, database. So what we can do from here is we can start interacting with the table. So let's like run some setting or run some commands here. So I'm just doing create table customers, customer ID int and first name Varchar. Let's go ahead and click on run. And this should hopefully work. Yep. So no rows changed. And we can see that this table um, was created successfully. Now we just want to do a quick little insert into this table just to populate it with a row. So we're inserting uh, customer ID and first name with one and John Doe. Going to click on run. And then we can see here that that was success. And then let's do a select to actually visualize everything and make sure that everything was inserted correctly. 
And we can see here we have our customer ID and our John Doe, which is perfect. So this is a good way to just kind of experiment by running some queries and make sure that everything is set up correctly. Um, now, keep in mind that if you're trying to interact with this through, you know, Python or Node.js or something like that, then you are going to need to use an SDK, especially if you're using the data plane API, which is why it is uh, such a powerful tool. So let me just kind of bring in here a preview of how you can do that. So you would use the RDS client, which is, this is for Python, by the way, and you would say execute statement. And there's this notion here of secret ARN. And the reason that this is required is because the data API does not use um, user credentials, so login and password. Instead, it requires that whoever is attempting to run you know, this statement or this command has a user that has access to the secret key that contains the credentials. So it's a slightly different model than what you may be used to, but I think it's much more effective at making sure that the right people uh, are staying in control of the credentials uh, that are used to access this database. From there, you provide the database, then you provide the resource ARN or the DB cluster ARN, uh, just to kind of remind you on how you can do that. Go to databases, go to this guy, go to configuration, and your ARN is right here. Uh, which is this entire string. And then uh, you would put your actual SQL in here. So you would say like, you know, select, oops, select star from blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's what it looks like. And in an upcoming video, I'm gonna show you how to do this using a Lambda function so that you can combine serverless on the database side and serverless on the compute side. So you have an entirely serverless application. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video and got some use out of it. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.